Yeah, thank you. Um, as, as, as Tim sort of said, the whole the whole point of this this, uh, this afternoon wasn't really wasn't going to be that it should be so military veteran veteran centric. Um, so don't be put off by these first two first two talks. Um, Lisa obviously comes from that sort of background, and I'm I'm just talking about the only thing that I know anything about these days. Um, so which is Water Uncovered, which is a charity we set up about five years ago. Um, so nothing to do with that Waterloo. Um, it took my son a while to realise that, um, but much, much more to do with this Waterloo. So the Battle of Waterloo over in Belgium, um, sort of somewhere over there, very, very close to Brussels. Uh, 1815, for those of you who do, this isn't going to turn into a history lesson, but um, we can sort of rattle through it. I don't know if you know these guys. So Napoleon, no, Napoleon there, well, he's in the chap over there. Sort of better. I'm not a historian. Um, but, um, Chapel of those Belusia was rather late to the party, but it came along in the nick of time. Um, so if you don't really know what was going on, the Napoleonic Wars, angry Frenchman who was running around trying to conquer the whole of Europe, um, doing a rather good a job there until Napoleon came along with the help of the Prussians, managed to, in 1815, um, finally, finally defeat him. Um, this is what might have happened, apparently. Um, you know, good classical sort of red and blue squares moving around a battlefield which is exactly why we need to do archaeology to actually make some sort of sense of this and find out really what, what could have happened. Um, what we do know happened is this, um, is in 2015, um, we had our first ever excavation on, on the battlefield. Um, so I think it's about, it's about 60 odd people, or about 60 people involved in that, in that dig back in 2015. Um, that was us in 2017, you can see it's sort of slightly growing. Uh, this year, the excavation that we've come back from had over 150 people involved. Um, and it's not just a two-week excavation that we now run, it's something slightly bigger. It's a big 12-month affair, which I'll talk about as we go through. So, but where did we get there? Um, actually, before this photo was taken, I used to study, I studied archaeology at UCL. Um, so I don't pretend to claim to be an archaeologist. Um, I do have an MA in museum studies. Um, <laughs> But just, oh, just. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then after after, leave, after leaving leaving the institute, um, I sort of dipped into broadcasting and went on that well trodden route into the Coldstream Guards, um, along with uh, along with a friend of mine, Charlie Fournette, who also studied archaeology with me at, at UCL. So the two of us went along there. Charlie's career is slightly different. He is currently still in the, in the army. In fact, he's actually in Iraq at the moment. Um, whereas in 2010, I ended up leaving the army, having um, been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. Um, had about a, what, think, what, what they call your journey of recovery, um, which involved many, many things, um, like setting up a yoga studio, um, as well as before I came back to archaeology. Uh, yeah. yoga, yoga, incredibly good for your mental health. Running a small startup business, not so good. <laughs> um, so anyway, there we were, 2014, I just sold a yoga studio, been on a very big holiday, very long holiday, and went for a pint with Charlie, who had been asked by his commanding officer to take some soldiers away to Belgium, to the battlefield of Waterloo, to get be involved in a, battle, in a battlefield tour. Um, sometimes we wonder why we're doing this project, because we all really know in our hearts that the Coldstream Guards single-handedly won the Battle of Waterloo. Um, but Charlie, Charlie had been asked, Charlie had been asked to take, take the battalion, that's why Charlie had been asked by the, his, his commanding officer to take the battalion away to go and take them a tour around the battlefield in 2015 to sort of in, basically, I suppose, brainwash them into, into believing that that was sort of the only way that history could have ever, could have ever happened. Um, Charlie, sort of uh, being the enlightened soul he was, was really rather overjoyed. Um, <clears throat> but he had a problem on his hands because he'd been told to take the entire battalion away. And um, there were quite a lot of guys at this point in time who were knocking around who were injured in one, one way or another. Some from places like Afghanistan, but much, much, many more from in training. And that's just the way that most soldiers, most soldiers actually get injured, training accidents, car accidents, then war, um, in that order. Anyway, uh, so he'd, he'd, he'd spoke to the commanding officer, the commanding officer used to be in, sort of in the paras, like running around a lot. His idea of a battlefield tour was doing a lot of running around and stopping every now and again to be talked to about history and things. And Charlie pointed out this wasn't so good for the guys, he probably couldn't do much sort of running. Um, so what he decided, so what he asked the commanding officer he could do is if he could bring them out to do some archaeology. Um, as mad as it sort of sounds, I believe the commanding officer practically fell off his chair when he heard, when he, when he heard the question. But Charlie points out, one, it would be a good opportunity to get them involved. Two, Charlie had been desperately trying to get soldiers to do archaeology ever since he left, ever since he left university. And three, it's explained to the commanding officer that this would be a wonderful opportunity for us to prove to the world once and for all that the Coalition Guards really did win the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> um, 
So that's where we were in 2015. We took about 20 people out to Waterloo, uh, about 10 archaeologists and about 10, ser 10 serving soldiers, um, and a couple of, couple of minibuses um, for a week's worth of archaeology. It wasn't just us, though, because um, <coughs> apparently our sort of BAs and MAs at UCL didn't quite cut, cut the mustard. Um, and we managed to put together quite an interesting team or group of people. Is this going to go? Yeah. Um, who are now partners in the project. Uh, University of Glasgow, it's got Tony Pollard up there who runs most of our, a lot of our archaeology. So you've got LP Archaeology, you might have come across a chap with Stewie, um, he's another one who used to be there. Orbit, these guys from Ghent, they do all our geophysics. They're not actually archaeologists, they're soil scientists. Um, they get kind of weird when you sort of show them, when you talk to them about geophysics as far as archaeologists, they think it's insanely backwards, um, kind of archaic, and very, very, very shocked and surprised. Um, w, uh, w, SPW, Wallonian, the uh, Service Public Wallonian, Wallonian, the that's the basis of the Wallonian government, they're involved, and UC University College Road were part of the University of Utrecht. So these are sort of five partners that came together for this one week to go out and see what was going to happen. Um, and lo and behold, what we, what we found was, um, we found, we were very, very lucky, we found there was enough archaeology, there was actually archaeology there, which we weren't really sure about. We found that it actually had a positive effect on the, sol on the soldiers that had been out there. When they went home, they saw their, their chain of command ported back. They come back with a new sense of enthusiasm, which was great. And we found that the team got on really, really well, which was which was amazing. So um, at the end of a week, and maybe after a beer or two, we suddenly decided this was obviously such a good idea that we were going to come back the next summer or that very summer and run the same project, but twice as long, twice as many people. And that's what we've been doing since. Um, we have, however, built that sort of program around around four aims. Um, we as I said very soon after it became a charity. So those aims are professional archaeology, which we fundamentally think is the is the core of what we what core of what we do. We wouldn't be allowed to excavate on the battlefield of Water Waterloo without having an incredibly professional archaeological sort of setup. Um, supporting the veterans and serving military personnel, which is integral to the sort of the, the project. Multinational cl collaboration um, is really key, not least because it's in a well, not just because it's the project in another country. Um, but also because I think I fundamentally believe if you really want to understand a battle, it's quite important to understand it from as many different perspectives as possible, and not least when some of the, those, some of those the accounts of the battle are written in other languages and you might not have access to them otherwise. Um, and education and outreach, I think all good students of, of Tim's or anyone who's been at Arche studying archaeology UCL believe there's not really much point doing archaeology unless you're telling people about it and that it's good and fun and proper and you should be telling people about it. So that's the four aims. But what do we do? I'm going to focus on from here, from here on in, the serving veteran and military personnel bit, because um, that's the well-being sort of side. Because there's four different, there's five different areas that we support: our um, veterans and serving military personnel, in recovery, both mental, medical, me mental health and well-being, education, employment, and transition. And transition, I think, as Lisa was saying, is that sort of. In the military terms, we talk about that move from um, move from the civilian world in, or to move from the military world into, into the civilian world, which a lot of people can find find quite traumatic. Um, we have on occasion played around with a sort of Venn diagram here because, as you might as you, as you might not be surprised here, these all of these all of these factors over overlap in one way or another. Um, we're also very quick to point out, and I'll come to selection in a second. Um, but you might, we don't, our project is, this project isn't just about injured people. Um, we take a lot of people who are physically and mentally actually probably fine, um, may need a little bit of well-being support, might need a bit of education, education or employment help, which is least said to be ties back into your well-being, into your well-being anyway. So those are the five things that we do, uh, and how do we do this? So we create, we do this over the 12-month goal-orientated process. I'm going to go into the, talk about these in a little bit more detail in a second. So, uh, appropriate levels of support, learning from experience, funding and resourcing, and we're not in a rush, which is it's slightly ironic in the way I'm gabbling through these slides. Um, so, a 12-month process. Um, this is this is important. This is for our UK participants, and this is just really to give sort of, I think to give you an understanding or, or of what we do. This isn't meant to be a blueprint for what anyone else wants to do or should do depending on who they're, what type of archaeology they're trying to do or who they're trying to help or anything like that. This is just the way that we've, that we've, we've come to it. And please draw your own conclusions. Um, so a 12-month process, which developed over five years, as I said, it started off with really just um, a group of people coming out for two, for two weeks. 
sort of selection process was. We spoke to the company cell major and said, have you got any blokes that are injured? And he went, him, 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 him. Um, several archaeologists that week learned for the first time, came, came across the, came across the uh, uh, voluntoldi for the first time, <laughs> which they, uh, they thought was rather. Anyway, so relationship building, phase zero. We spend a lot of our time speaking to and working with organisations, largely in this case veterans and serving, and, and organisations to support serving, serving military personnel. So that they understand what we do, so that we understand what they do, so that when it comes to finding people to come on the project, um, we can actually find the people who are going to get the best or get the most out of it. And they are people who are appropriate for the, for the sort of service we provide. So we're not trying to do everything. We're quite, we are really quite niche, even though we've got this sort of five, these five areas. So that, we spend a lot of time doing that. Phase one is application then. Um, and so some, some of those organisations, things like Help for Heroes, Royal, you know, Royal British Legion, uh, the MOD itself, all those sort of people, as well as individual regiments, which are always quite good at looking after, after their own. Um, the application process then, some people sort of ask whether this is actually a, is this a phase, is it that, that what, people, are people getting benefits from this? And the answer is yes, because actually we believe that actually if you're going through an application, actually putting yourself out to go through an application phase is, is something that could really, you know, something that can be quite hard, hard for you to do. You're by already engaging in the application process, you're accepting a degree of personal responsibility and even conquering some sort of fears, fears of rejection. So actually the application itself is really, really, you know, I think we've all been there, where we've all had to apply for universities or God knows what else. And it can be quite a daunting process. Um, so this kicked off in, in February, it's been about, it's been about a month of the, applica the application out there. Um, because we've done a lot of relationship building, we don't have a big, wide, sort of social media driven uh, application process. It's much more tar much more targeted than that, and which with the sort of small team we've got is also the only way we can manage it. Selection then, um, after we've looked at the applications and decided who's going who's to come forward, um, selection we usually, we try and take the selection phase about twice as many people as are actually going to come on the come on the project, because there will be some wastage in terms of one people not being suitable, but people also dropping out over the period over over the period period of time. Um, so selection we conduct a series of Skype interviews with with individuals. Um, as well as going through their, their application forms. We take, we take about a month to get them to manage the selection process and there'll be follow-up interviews as well if, if we need them. Because again, like the application, we see selection as being an important part of the service that we, we provide. We might be talking to people who may not have had a conversation with somebody, a serious conversation for, for a couple of weeks. They might not have had an opportunity to talk to people about what they think or what they feel. And as much as it's us about trying to find things out about them, we're also listening to them and hearing what, they, hearing what they've got to say. So actually being part of the selection process, for a lot of people, it's as much as about, it's about us being there and listening to them, them being engaged in a, in, a, in a process, which even if they're not successful in, can still be a positive, can still then be, be a positive experience. Um, which is probably the best point here to, to talk about rejection side, because it is something we do, we do have to manage. It is taken very, very seriously. Um, and it, it really isn't very. It really isn't rocket science, but it is done with things like phone calls and conversations, as opposed as opposed to emails. It's done with a decent degree of feedback, depending on what the ind what the individual wants, as well. So you know, if they don't want to hear, if they don't, if they're not interested in hearing what you've got to say, it's not about preaching to them and trying to change change their lives. But if there is if there is things that you can help them with, then it's about letting them know. Um, and we don't do signposting anymore. Apparently, that's yesteryear. We do brokering. Um, so rather than so if anyone need, if anyone needs or we can spot we can identify something that somebody needs a way that we can help them an organisation that we can point them in the direction the directional rather than just point them in the direction we'll actually take them there and speak to somebody there and not physically always take them there but actually we'll still, we'll, we'll initiate that conversation as opposed to just sort of go oh here's a few here's a few websites you might want to look at or something like that which is sadly the way that some people do things like that phase three then um, build up so. So you've got February, March, so April through to June. Um, we have a number of different events and things that we run with people. We bring them down to the British Museum where they do some fines handling. We send them to the National Museum where they do some fines, fines handling and have a look at the history of the Battle of Waterloo. Um, it's a process that involves getting people out of their homes, moving around, move, moving around the country, traveling, in, traveling independently, um, having, to manage their, having to manage their own diaries, meeting, meeting, new, meeting new people. We get them involved with a bit of fundraising as well. We have a series of over those like four months, a series of conversations from everything to do. So fundraising to administration to a little bit of research, we even ask them to get involved with as well. And it's about it's about gradual building up the level of contact we have with them, making them feel that they're a part of something, which they very much are. And ultimately for us, 
you know, when we look down to it, what, what's, what's the thing that we really want to do with the build-up phase? We want to make sure that this person that we've selected, invested time in, actually makes it on the Saturday, the first Saturday of July, actually gets to London so that we can put them on a minibus and take them for two weeks away to Belgium. Because we're pretty convinced that if we can get them there and do that, then we can have, then we can do something really special. We can do something really special with them. But for a lot of people, the people again that we select, coming away for two weeks on their own, you know, with or without 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 the family or without the support, it's quite it's, good. it's quite a big deal. So that's why again we put a lot of effort into making sure they get there to make sure we can get the best results out. Um, the excavation phase, I won't go into some too much detail because Lisa's sort of covered, but um, you can see you know, there's everything from being outside being part of a team, being part of a process, actually having, having, a, real, having a real purpose. Um, I think for those of you, I mean, I, I still remember the very first time I, I found something field walking by, or Stewie tossed it away. Um, okay, but anyway, that's another story. But yeah, there's that whole, that process of that discovery, that magic, of the magic that is archaeology. And as Lucy was saying, that's those very simple things that involve like digging a trench and having it find a purpose. Um, follow on phase, we come back. Um, and there's a lot more conversations between us and the organisations that people have come from. And again, it's, it's not so much this signposting anymore. It's much more this actually really working with people, working out what they want to do, which I'll come on to in a second. Phase six is a longer term plan. We've got a Facebook page. Hooray, we must be doing something right. Um, but no, we're still, we're still working out. We're still, it's one of the things we're still working out is actually how, how do we manage this long term interaction? Um, because for some people that can be positive. For other people that could be ne negative. There are things like dependencies that you need to talk about. Um, and play around, play around with. So that phase six, that longer term plan, once they come back and once we've, once we've moved, once we've allowed, once we sort of help them go in the next direction they're going, that for us is sort of a piece of the puzzle that we're, we're not 100% about, uh, I'm sure about. So if anyone's got any ideas, please let me know. Um, appropriate levels of support. These are really important. Um, so we have you know, an experienced and good sized team, our well, our well -being, our, our well our wellbeing team. Um, we've got a working group of about eight or so professionals who give their time, time freely. Um, they're all very, very, very top drawer in terms of their experience and most of them experience with serving military people. When we're on the ground, for instance, in, in uh, Waterloo, there will always be at least, at least four well-being people there. There'll be a couple, there'll be a, some sort of one or, two, one or two people in a leading role and then two others and they're always usually always working sort of male-female pairs. They will be in and amongst the people who are on the project, uh, listening to their, you know, basically listening to, listening to what's going on, seeing if they can help, help them along. This, you know, what, we, what we do is not therapy, very, very much definitely not. Um, training, we do offer training for all those who are interested, who are interested in it. Um, Cornelius, you've been on a, one of the courses that we, we send people on, which is a veterans mental health um, first aid course. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that you need to go and do a, 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 all these courses, because quite a lot of it is common sense, and there are certain things that we do in-house as well. So, you know, say if there are, be careful about courses and things and what they're, what they're, what they're offering, what they, what they really show, what they deliver. And briefings of the code of conduct, I think that's actually essential, really essential to what, we, to what we do. We just make sure that everyone who comes out on the project is singing off the same hymn sheet when it comes to what we expect, the way that we, they behave. Um, you know, jumping down, I mean, we, we still treat people like adults, very, very much so. People are allowed to make decisions. You know, at least said they can take a break from a trench whenever they want. They can have a, they can have a beer in the evening. They can they are they are adults, and that's that's the way they need to be need to be treated. But we also have very very strict sort of two strikes and you're out right policies, um, of which we only ever once had to only ever once had to enforce, which is really quite really quite amazing. Um, and then again, the knowing who, knowing who the beneficiaries are, um, which is a really important a project like ours. The archaeology is is absolutely vital and key to what we do. But the purpose of the project is the, benef the beneficiaries are the veterans, the seven person the veterans there, and our staff, our volunteers, they all come there with that, with that knowledge and that, and that purpose. Learning for experience, um, so planning considerations, you know, that's everything from, I think as Lisa, as Lisa was saying, being aware, of some of the, being aware of some of the physical and the mental um, needs that people might, that people might have, listening to, listening to people. Not being bloody minded in the way that we go, in the way that we go about things, and how we can, how we get how we get things done. Um, measuring results, I come to this in a second, but we do measure we both we measure quantitative and qualitative results. And this whole thing about this two way two way process, special simple personality and interpretation, is one of the things that we've noticed about the project that has been um, that every year people people come back and sort of beneficiaries comment on how, how beneficial it has been to them. 
the fact that actually they, they're the input that they could provide into the, into the archaeology, um, often linked to the fact that they've been in the military themselves. So whether that's the things that they've learned or because they've got a natural affinity or they've got an affinity, sort of an actual affinity to military and those, those sort of things. Um, but it means that they can actually, very, very early on, have great conversations with archaeologists where you're on a completely other path, um, which is a really, sort of really, really, really wonderful thing. I get, I, you know, sort of, I don't know, don't know whether that, whether you could take that sort of that, that theory and um, I don't know, excavate a brewery somewhere and get a whole load of sort of I don't know, ex brewers or ex publicans who needed they needed they needed a sort of change in, change in well being status and bring them into it and that kind of the same sort of thing. But for this project, with veterans on a military on a military battlefield, it works it works really really rather well. Um, and then significant funding and resourcing. That's the other thing which. We don't really, which we do, we do need to say. You know, we've got three full-time staff on this. We've got over 100 volunteers, and this year would co cost us approximately half a million pounds to, to run. Um, and that's the archaeology, the well-being, the whole lot of it. Yeah. Post-excavation, we have to fund that. We have to fund, find funds, find funds for all of that. That's sort the of things as well, as well as the education and the outreach things we do. Um, the other thing as well is we're not in a rush, um, which is really, really nice. And one of the reasons why the project does work. Somebody once said. I think it might have been recalling this, or maybe not. Maybe not. The slower we work, the more people we can help. Um, so we're going to be there for another five years at least. Uh, we're definitely doing the geophysics of the entire battlefield next year, which is amazing. Um, and we've got a whole host of other ideas that we're looking that we're looking to um, looking to instigate. So ways to actually take the small amount of excavation work that we do and multi multiply the effect through outreach, outreach and education, um, and getting more people involved. And that's sort of like phase two. Of the project we're moving through. So how do we get our results? Because I know Tim's very interested in this. Um, there's, two, there's, two, there's two sort of ways we do, we, we do our results really. Uh, Warwick Edinburgh, was it Warwick Edinburgh Mental? Oh, I always get confused. Well-being. Well -being. Anyway, we, we, use, we, use the, we use the Webmiss um, measure of well-being. Uh, we've used it ever since the beginning. It's a recognized, universally, internationally recognized measure um, that allows us to show how the well-being of the individuals being on the project has, has improved. So if you look at our 2008, 2019 results, a total of 18 participants, shows 30 goals and well, but that's the wrong slide, isn't it? Aha, I'm reading the wrong bet, I've gone as far. Um, did, did you see okay? No, that's not it. Uh, is it on the right there? Yeah, that is, yeah. Ah, I can see what you've done. Okay. <laughs> Mark did this presentation himself. <laughs> <laughs> Not, anyway, I know I'm taking too long. So Warwick Edinburgh stuff, and we, we, we've showed the scores have gone up according to that. This is the this is this is the most important thing that we do. Um, this, is, this, is, this is linked to the, um, the sort of the other the other, the other thing we do, which is sort of least of information, is that when we actually when we interview people at the beginning of that process, um, what we do is we identify individual goals with everyone who comes everyone who comes on the project. We think that's really important. So not everyone who comes on the project will have a well-being aim. Some might have an education aim. Some might have a, uh, a, tran a transition aim. And using it, or sort of, funnily enough, by the time we get to the end of the project, we note that nearly all of them have had a well-being. The well-being benefits. And I'm being asked to move on. Um, da -da 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 -da. And I'm saying, let's not forget the staff and volunteers because they get something out, as well, out of it as well. I think that's a hugely important thing, and why they keep, why they, why they all keep coming back. Um, we have, as yet to date, spared them the. The sort of uh, spare, spared, spared, spared them the hassle of us collecting data on them because we think it might actually drive drive them mad. But um, if you have a chat to any of them, they'll certainly tell you that it's they get something out of the project, um, which is really good to see. Um, I just thought I'd throw in some slides to just show you some of the archaeology because um, just to prove that we do some um, da -da -da, some finds, um, some great friends and experiences. That's getting university on their quad bike, which they love and always like us to show. That's another one for them. So the future, what are we looking at? Uh, more archaeology, more support for veterans and so military personnel, more multinational collaboration, more education outreach, and more research. In fact, we're going to be working with King's College in the coming year to put together a and uh, working on an academic paper that looks at the well-being, at the, at the well-being work that we actually do. And, and we're, you know, we're lucky enough to be in a position where we, where we can do that and actually get people who are really qualified and have the broad breadth of, broad breadth of experience to come in and help us support us doing that. Um, anyway, so that's that's just a quick brief overview of what we do. Um, if anyone is interested in getting involved or being or learning more, please please let me know. Thank you very much, Mark. Um.